This is a Veterans History Project oral history interview with Dr. Harold Arberg on Monday, September 5th, 2005. Dr. Arberg, would you please state your full name and date of birth? Harold Walton Arberg, August 19, 1918. Where were you born, Dr. Arberg? Brooklyn, New York. And where did you graduate from high school? Montclair, New Jersey High School. Do you recall where you were when World War I, World War II broke out? Yes, I was up in Pennsylvania attending my brother's wedding. Now, <clears throat> if you see, not when World War II actually began in 1939. I was still in Princeton. But our entry into the war, Pearl Harbor, occurred, of course, in December 6 of 1941. And I was attending my brother's wedding in Johnsonburg, Pennsylvania. Dr. Arberg, let's take a, a step back because we're talking December of 1941. And I had asked you about you were born in Brooklyn and then graduated yes. from high school in Montclair, New Jersey. Correct. You said. What did you do after high school, between high school and the outbreak of World War II for the United States? Well, I applied to Princeton University in Princeton, New Jersey. It was the only <coughs> college that I actually applied to, but I went right to Princeton in the fall of 1936. Graduated four years later in 1940. <coughs> The reason I chose Princeton is that I'd seen a production of the Princeton Triangle Club in Montclair, and I thought it was the greatest thing I'd seen, so I said, that's the college I'd like to attend if they can produce Triangle. And of course, uh, they had distinguished Triangle graduates. Jimmy Stewart was uh, with Triangle, graduated in 1932, and Joshua Logan who wrote uh, the book to South Pacific and became an outstanding director, was with Triangle and graduated in 31. And Jose Ferrer became an outstanding uh, actor, played Cyrano and countless other roles, graduated in 1933. So those were three Princetonians out of Triangle. But that was the reason that I applied to Princeton and. Uh, they accepted me, and uh, that, that was that. Graduated in 1940. What did you do in the year and a half between 1940 and the uh, outbreak of, I, of World War II? I uh, got a job. I, as a pianist, I was playing six nights a week in a, in a neighborhood uh, lounge and teaching piano during the day with my former piano teacher, who himself had been a personal pianist to Thomas Edison. Edison hired him uh, to play for him the music that was sent in to be recorded. His name was Ernest Stevens. And I was invited by Ernie to come back and teach with him in his studio in the Montclair Theater building. And I did that until uh, I was drafted in October of 1942. Well, we were saying you continued to work uh, teaching piano and, yes. and in the music arts until yes. you were drafted in October of 1942. Yes. Where were you when you were drafted? in October of 1942. We were living in Montclair, New Jersey. Our first son had been born, and we had an apartment, a one-room apartment with a Murphy bed that slid out from a dressing room. How long had you been married? We were married in 1941. So we've been married 64 years. Well, that's terrific. So you had already been married and had a child? Right. Your, your child was born in 1942? Yes. 
August of 42. Mm -hmm. What happened, how did you get noticed in October 1942 that you were drafted? Well, I, I read it in the newspa newspaper because uh, in the, the announcement of my reclassification, in those years you had a classification. If you had a physical disability, you were 4F, for example. But if you were eligible, you were 1A. And if you were married with a child, that was another classification. But I, <clears throat> I never received the reclassification notice where we lived in the apartment. So I actually read it in the newspaper and didn't have time, therefore, to apply for any officer training program. So I was drafted as a buck private in October of uh, 42. When you were drafted, how did you get word you were drafted? Did you did you learn about that well, in the paper? Or? You, no, you you get a a dear John letter which says report. To, <laughs> I <clears throat> went to Fort Dix, New Jersey. Before we went to Fort Dix, New Jersey, you got notification in October of 1942. Right. That you had to be you were a part. Of, you you were drafted. Right. How did that? Your immediate thoughts were. Or what? Tell me, tell me your reaction at that time. Well, I, I knew I was going to go in, into service. I hadn't, uh, I hadn't taken ROTC training at at Princeton because I'd spent four years in the Junior Essex Troop, a famous cavalry unit out of Newark, the 102nd Cavalry. And they formed a junior troop so that young high school boys could learn to become cavalrymen, learned to ride and to shoot and to, to have all the skills. So having done that for four years during high school, I wasn't uh, about to sign up for more ROTC training at Princeton. I regretted that later when I, when I got drafted as a private, but that's the way it worked out. Mm -hmm. How did you get to Fort Dix, New Jersey, once you were uh, given notice that you were uh, drafted? Well, it's just, a tra it's just a train ride down to F Fort Dix mm -hmm. from um, my home in Montclair, New Jersey. What did you bring with you? Just <laughs> very little. Just a, a civilian outfit, and you were issued things down there. I remember my... Jacket size was a 36 in those years. I'm, this jacket I'm wearing is a 42 now, so there's been a little expansion over the years, but not too much. When you arrived at Fort Dix, uh, tell me what happened then. Well, it's it's a reception center, and you are you're placed in a, in a in a pool about to be assigned for training. And I was assigned to the what was in those years called the <clears throat> the Army Air Corps Technical Training Command, and placed on a troop <clears throat> train to, to Miami Beach, Florida, which was where the Technical Training Command was located. Mm -hmm. Between the time you got to Fort Dix and the time you were assigned to the Army Air Corps, how long was that? Very short, perhaps a week or so. Had you any idea that's where you're going to be assigned? No. Okay. And you were you you're entering the service as a private. As a as a private, since I'd had a college degree, I think they made me an acting corporal and assigned me to. That meant I could read and write, I guess. So uh, I was an acting corporal, but. Paid as a buck private, and the pay was twenty-one dollars a month in nineteen forty-two. You took a troop train to Miami. Yes, and a troop train out of Miami to destinations unknown. You were never advised where the troop train was going for security reasons. So from Miami, I was placed on another troop train heading west. Before we get to that, Go Dr. Ahead. Arberg, tell me yeah. again the the uh, the arrival in Miami. How how about what time of year did you get to Miami? 
well, I went in uh, October, I would have gotten to Miami in the mid-October and stayed there maybe maybe two weeks. Did you, we have, any, we did you have any basic we, training in Miami? We, yes, we had close order drill okay. in the streets. Close order drill is you learn how to march, you learn how to, to manip manipulate troops by the right flank. Ho! Oh, <laughs> mm -hmm. And a Sergeant Hicks who uh, taught we didn't have any basic training beyond uh, firing a weapon, a carbine, which is mm -hmm. the sign, and we even uh, fired machine guns into the uh, into the ocean. Mm -hmm. But very soon thereafter, was given orders. We knew not where, but it was on a troop train. Mm -hmm. Got as far as Kansas City, Missouri in the middle of the night. The, the train was pulled over on a siding, and I was about to pull night KP on that train, mm -hmm. which is not fun. Sitting up all night peeling potatoes with cinders in your eye. And just before I was to do that, Two young officers came through the troop train, paging Private Arnberg. Here, sir. And they said, young man, you're going to take a little boat ride. Which meant I was going to be shipped overseas someplace. Pulled off this train. And I was sent back to Camp Butner, North Carolina. B-U-T-N-E-R, Camp Butner. It's outside of Durham, which is the home of Duke, as you know. Mm -hmm. And there I reported to what was the Persian Gulf Command. It was a secret command being set up in the Persian Gulf to run supplies up to the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union being our strong ally, as you recall, during World War II. But I didn't know at that time where I was going. I simply knew that I was with the Persian Gulf Command. And eventually, and we crossed the country again by troop train to Camp Stoneman outside of San Francisco. That was the embarkation port. Talk to me a little bit. Let's let's go back, um, California. Mm -hmm. Let's go back a little bit. You're taking a night a train from Miami to points unknown. Yes. And you, how long have you been on the train before it, you get outside of Kansas City? How long you well, on the train? in those days, that that was probably a couple of days travel. What was the train ride like? How who were you in with? The what train was? ride, in, <laughs> you. There were th three. You shared an, uh, an upper and lower berth with two other guys. And there was a mess car, and you would walk through the mess car doing about face with your mess, <coughs> mess kit, your tray, and your utensils, and you pick up your food and go back to your seat. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, it was what I, I was doing, and I was called on KP, as I as I said, but uh, was taken off the train. The only one taken off. How do you think they knew to take you off? What was what? How did you figure that I, one out? I learned later. This was the when you when you enter service, you list your background, what your college major was. I wrote music, which was what I did major in at Princeton. And these were the IBM cards, the punch cards that time. So the commanding general of special services was a general Kerr at that time. And he felt that there ought to be, apparently felt there should be a morale and entertainment specialist in this new command. So he went through and punched the cards and my card apparently jumped up 
and therefore they tagged me and uh, I became the entertainment specialist for this new Persian Gulf Command that was being formed for Iran. And we, we had a long, long boat ride out of San Francisco. We, mm -hmm. Before we get to San Francisco, tell me again, you, 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 where did you go like, physically when you were pulled off this train in Kansas City? Where did you wind up in, uh, how did you get on a train? They, they gave me uh, orders back to Camp Butner, North Carolina. They gave me a, a train ticket and put me on a train that went back. I went immediately back to North Carolina mm -hmm. to that staging area. Mm -hmm. When you're on the train back to uh, North Carolina, was that were you on a tr train by yourself with uh, yes, civilians? Yes, by myself. And then when you got to Camp Butner, how long were you there for? Do you recall? Right, I I was at, at Butner. This would have been November, and we were on a at Camp Butner. We didn't uh, get on the troop train. I was there about a month. Mm -hmm. And what happened at Camp Butner? What were you doing when you were at Camp Butner? I was doing close, close. Well, I was already called upon to to entertain troops. We had blackout situations and uh, I would be called upon to uh, to play or lead, lead them in in singing or What's a blackout situation that you're talking about? Explain that. I have to I have to move ahead. You're thinking about yeah. the singing to the troops at Camp Butner uh, for that month that you were there. Mm -hmm. What kind of things were you doing? What was uh, what was happening where you called a could you tell us what a blackout situation was that uh, may have uh, gotten them involved? I, <clears throat> I have to uh, say the blackout occurred later in, in the Persian Gulf Command. Oh, okay. Not at Butner. I'm but were you singing the troops at Camp Butner at that point in North Carolina near Duke? Right, in a, in a staging area. Um, not all that much because most of the people were getting ready for a transfer overseas, getting their equipment ready. So that was largely a, simply a, a staging area. What were you yeah. learning in the Persian Gulf uh, about this new Persian Gulf Command? Virtually nothing because uh, all, <clears throat> all you were given was a code number. It was 1616A. Was the code number for the Persian Gulf Command. The command itself was secret because the uh, mm -hmm. the security requirement at that time mm -hmm. was such that uh, overseas shipments you were never told what your destination was. You simply knew that you were going to be on an overseas uh, shipment. At this point, when you get back to Camp Butner, you recognize that you're you're going to be going overseas at some point, mm -hmm. and you're at Camp Butner. Mm -hmm. Are you doing any any physical training at Camp Butner as well, Dr. Arber? Not really. Mm -hmm. That was strictly in Miami Beach, at Butner. It was largely a staging area. It was a question of getting your equipment ready uh -huh. and ready to move out. <clears throat> Excuse me, move out. Are you still a private at this point? Yes. And are you? Where are you staying in Camp Butner? What were your quarters in like? A, just an army barracks, mm -hmm. a cot, mm -hmm. and a and a blanket. You stood inspections. Mm -hmm. You had to keep your shoes shined. And, uh, mm -hmm. I remember the Colonel Weber was standing inspection, and he was looking at my shoes. He said, "This." This fellow can really shine in a pair of shoes. So that was my uh, distinction at that time, having the shiniest shoes in the company. 
With the, uh, at the end of Camp Butner, how did you learn that you were going to Camp Stoneham? Did you know? No. Tell us what happened there. We were simply put on a, a, a troop train out of Durham and headed west. What was the, when the decision was made to put you on a troop train, had they decided that you had reached a point of staging that they, you knew at this whole time that you were going to be assigned somewhere else? Yes. During this month. Right. And you didn't know very much at all about this Persian Gulf you Command. You didn't know, know anything at all. You didn't even, did you even know it was called a Persian Gulf Command? No. Okay, you just knew about that code name. 1616A, mm -hmm. we were going to be shipped to an unknown destination overseas, and we were on a... Mm -hmm. Did you sense that with you when you were with others about their skills and background? What, what were some of the other people, some of the other men that were assigned? That was a, a learning experience for me because I've met up with a number of other a number of guys who hadn't had my educational opportunities, but they all could do things that I couldn't do. They, they came from all walks. They may have been carpenters or electricians. Or they had skills mm -hmm. that I didn't have, mm -hmm. but they didn't have the educational opportunities that I had had. You know, in that sense, it's a very leveling experience, mm -hmm. and I got to, uh, to to respect people for what they could do, what they knew that I didn't know. And I suppose they respected me for things that I could do that they couldn't. So it was a, a mutual respect that developed among the uh, guys coming in from all walks of life. Camp Butner, you're put on a train. You're ordered to 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 be shipped out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that and that that process. Where did you go from Camp Butner? How did you get to the train? Where did it leave from? Well, it's in Butner is outside of Durham, mm -hmm. so we they would have bussed us to the train station and uh, simply board the board the troop train. Everybody, it's all yeah, troops. Right. And you're not told where you're going? No. Okay. What, what are your quarters like on the train? What's that like? Well, it's a low, upper and lower berth, and you're, you're simply assigned to a, a particular berth. Mm -hmm. you're, you're marched through the mess car mm -hmm. to get fed and do an about face and then come back. And it was uh, in that uh, procedure that I was the, the last one. I'd had a bona fide call from nature, so I was a little bit late in getting in line. And I would have been the first one to get fed since I was the last one in line doing an about face. So the mess sergeant said, all right, Arberg, it's night KP for you. I think you're getting mixed up. No, what? That's okay. You're you're you've left um, Durham, North Carolina. You're on a train, mm -hmm. and you have an upper and lower berth. You're you're not told where you're going. No. You're not told how long it's going to take. Mm -hmm. How long does uh, how long does the trip take? What do you do for yourself during those during the time? Uh, well, we played cards. Uh, mm -hmm. Told you know, but it's a pretty boring situation. Mm -hmm crossing the country again, ending up in uh, San Francisco. Did you, when you, rec when you got to San Francisco, did you know, how did you realize this is, this was the end of the line? What, uh, tell me. Well, you're, you're in a staging area, mm -hmm. and they have what, what are called dry runs in the Army. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Which means that you were told, get your, you got a you got a duffel. There were two duffel bags. There was an A bag and a B bag. A bag you kept with you. The B bag had your other belongings, and that was shipped separately overseas. And you've got your your rifle and your mess kit and your full field equipment. And for several times, 
while we were at Camp Stoneman, mm -hmm. we were told to get ready to ship out. We would do that, but it would be a dry run. You'd board a truck and go over to the port, but there was no ship there. And so you'd be, you'd go back to your, uh, to your quarters. This was the dry run. It was simply a rehearsal. So we did that two or three times. Mm -hmm. Pretty frustrating. But about the third time, we went and here was this huge transport. For me, it was the Mauritania of the Cunard Line. The command used three luxury liners that had been converted to troop carriers. The first was the USS America, which had been named, renamed the West Point. That took a load, and that went one route to the Middle East, around below uh, South America. And, uh, the second was the, the French, Ile de France, that took another uh, 5,000 troops and went still another route. And the third ship was the one I was on, the Mauritania, in Canard, and we went from San Francisco to Pearl Harbor, to Wellington, New Zealand, and ran to Bombay, India, and then got a smaller ship that took us another week up to the Persian Gulf. The Iraq, actually, is where we landed. Tell me about this this trip on the Mauritania. How yeah. how long? About what time of year was it that you re recall getting on the the Mauritania? Do you remember what time? Yes, it was January the twelfth of nineteen forty three. Are you in any kind of communication with your wife at this time, with your family? Yes, all all. Actually, my, my wife and my mother came down to Camp Butner to see me before I shipped out. But once you've gone, you don't know where you're going, so you, you have no, uh, your mail is actually censored, mm -hmm. too, so that you, even if you did know, you wouldn't be able to uh, inform them. So all they know at that time is that I'm going overseas someplace, mm -hmm. but they don't know where, nor do I. Mm -hmm. um, when you got on to the Mauritania, yes. what was your what was your birth like? What was that like in there? The Mauritania was built to handle perhaps two thousand uh, passengers. There were five thousand troops on, so you can imagine the quarters were very crowded. Mm -hmm. We didn't have a berth. We, you had a hammock, mm -hmm. and in my case, I slept in the mess hall and would sling a hammock up over the mess tables. I'm just going to ask Mrs. Arger. Mm -hmm. Dr. Arber, you were talking about the, uh, the ship was built to handle 2,000 and over 5,000 were on yes. it? Very crowded. And you had very little to do. You had a hammock near the KP area. Yeah, okay. in the mess hall, and you would sling a hammock and uh, and sleep in that. Were you told where you were going? No. <laughs> Didn't know. What's that like? What's that like when you're on the? Well, your your life is completely in the hands of uh, of of the army and the military. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And during that long crossing, there was, we had, a, there was a band, the, Ar the Army was uh, still segregated during World War II, and we had a, a band of African American GIs, but they didn't have their instruments. Their instruments were shipped on another so that they were unable to play. I was a, I played piano. We had three chaplains on the Mauritania. Father Beck, the Catholic chaplain, best 
poker player on the ship, won all the guy's money and then gave it back to them. We had Chaplain Reuben, the Jewish chaplain, and we had a, a Protestant chaplain whose name escapes me. He was a Baptist minister. And they had religious services each day. It was about all there was to do. And I played for all three of the chaplains. And when we arrived in, in Tehran and Iran and the Persian Gulf, it was Passover time, and Chaplain Reuben went out and scoured the countryside and got fresh fowl and wine for a ugly Passover feast, and he invited his Protestant musician to join the feast. And my buddies were very envious of me there because we were eating sea rations out of cans. Mm -hmm. That was the only food we were given. We weren't living off the local economy at all. So that was a, a little side treat when we got there. When you, uh, how long were you on the troop ship, the Mauritania? Do you remember? Yes. We, we left on the, uh, the 12th of January, and we didn't arrive un until March, early March. You were on the troop ship the whole time? Yes. We, the, o the only time we were allowed off the ship was in Wellington, New Zealand. We got to Pearl Harbor, did not get off the ship, and from Pearl Harbor, you can get the, the geography, Honolulu is here, went south to Wellington, New Zealand, and there we were given brief shore leave, and the land never felt so good. Walking over those New Zealand hills was superb. We were there just several hours, and from there we went <clears throat> to Bombay. Mm -hmm. We went south of Australia, very rough water in the Tasmanian Sea, and on up to Bombay, India. How did you know where you were? How did you figure out where you were? Were you told as you were going no, to No, you, you were not told. We would see some destroyers with big holes blown into their bow and they would come along as escorts because we were in treacherous waters with Japanese submarines at that point. But the troop ships are able to travel much faster than the cargo ships so that we didn't go in a convoy with any protection at all. You took your chances. If a submarine could get you in its sights, that would be it, but they weren't able to catch you because the, the large liners were able to travel much faster than a submarine in those years. Maybe the nuclear subs that we have now uh, are much faster, but in those years. And that was the decision made to get the troops over there. They would send them by these fast passenger liners rather than putting them in a slow convoy with destroyer escorts. Did you have to do any uh, careful travel? Did you have to zigzag? I've heard stories about uh, the troop ships uh, going in we, different ways. Me, me, well, as I said, they used three separate routes to get three shipments of uh, GIs over to Iran. Three, mm -hmm. but within each route, there, there may have been some uh, some variations in the route. We were not privy to that. Those three ships you mentioned to me earlier that were all there in San Francisco, they all well, wound up going? No, they, they all went different routes and, and not all from San Francisco. We were, mm -hmm. the, we were the ones that went from San Francisco I to see. Pearl Harbor. I see. The others came out of the East Coast and went down below. Mm -hmm through the canal or... Uh, mm -hmm. And you all wound up in uh, the Persian Gulf Command. Right. Now, when you were traveling uh, on the ocean, uh -huh. did they ever have any drills to show you what to do in case you were attacked by a submarine? Uh, or that the ship was torpedoed? Or As a matter of fact, we did... Uh, Jane and I have been on several cruises, and, and on every cruise, 
the first day out, there's a mandatory, you, know, you put your life jackets on. We didn't do any of that. I don't think there were enough life jackets for 5,000 troops on uh, anyone, so I have no recollection of any of any any drills at all. Boredom was the main yeah. problem. You said you also played uh, and helped out with the church services? Right. I did, played for the church services. And uh, one, I had a friend who had smuggled his guitar on, and, and I organized a little combo, so we literally played every day to uh, entertain the guys. Did you ever go up, um, on, up top on the ship? Did you ever go out on the deck to walk around uh, to get air? Right. We were, I, I thought we, when, we, when we boarded the Mauritania, I said, we're with the headquarters company. We'll probably be up on deck. We were not. We were down <laughs> below the waterline, actually. But yes, you had free, free run of the ship, and you'd, you'd go up deck side uh, as much as possible. Try to get up and walk sure. around. Did you ever choose to sleep up on the deck? No. Okay. No. Did, did others? Did anybody may, done? May have. May have. Mm -hmm. Probably did. How about seasickness? Was that an issue? It was not with me, or or particularly with others. We had a, a spinal meningitis that broke out. That was a real concern to us, but fortunately it didn't uh, become uh, an epidemic. Mm -hmm. but there was some of the guys found uh, found it. They were a little queasy. Okay. But uh, my, I thought of my dad and his Norwegian uh, sailor ancestors, and that seemed to calm my <laughs> calm my stomach. The, uh, the the seas themselves in the two months you were out there were were pretty good. Right, we didn't have we didn't have any uh, hurricanes or any storms. Fortunately, you said you went through uh, Pearl Harbor. We went to, first to Pearl Harbor, I'll and then you. on to uh, Wellington, New Zealand. Wellington, to Bom Bombay, Bombay, and then from Bombay we got us a. a transferred to a smaller, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it was a British uh, ship that took us up to the Persian Gulf. Mm -hmm. The town was Hormshar, which is actually in Iraq. Mm. And from, we we stayed there in uh, in tents, mm -hmm. in the desert, mm -hmm. we dug our uh, latrine pits, mm -hmm. and we dumped our garbage into those too. After eating, and I I recall seeing tall Iraqis standing off. A couple of hundred yards away, maybe watching us. And uh, in the morning, they had cleaned out all the garbage that had been in our latrine pits, which gives you some idea of their hunger and general misery. But then we were transferred to a, a very rickety railroad okay. that, that went from <clears throat> from the Gulf up through Iran, the Brits had uh, built that railroad, but it was pretty rickety, and we had railway battalions over there to strengthen the, the railroad. See, we were there, the reason we were there was to run supplies up to the Soviet Union, and they went by that railroad, but most of them went by trucks, by Studebaker, two and a half ton trucks that were driven by Iranians at, at a wild paces up through these mountainous trails. 
it was a, a remarkable effort in my job. We, we built uh, camps about every hundred miles along this, what we call the motor transport route, the routes that the trucks would uh, follow to maintain the trucks and to ferry these supplies up through Iran to the Soviets. So I had a small piano and I would throw that on a two and a half ton truck with the help of some buddies and I would drive up a hundred miles and I'd do a show for these guys who were stranded there with absolutely nothing to do, just in the, uh, in the desolate parts of, uh, of Iran. And then go back and then I would go up another hundred miles and do another uh, show for them, carrying my own piano along the way. Gerard, tell me a little bit about your, when you get to Iraq, mm -hmm. and is this everybody that's offloaded off this ship? You, the yes. 5,000 of you have gone right. from one ship to another ship right. to Iraq, and then you take a railroad to, to Iran. Yeah. Where, right. Where did you go, where did you set up in Iran? Tehran, did you say? Tehran? Right. Uh, the headquarters was in Tehran. The Russians occupied the northern part of Iran, and we occupied the central and the southern part. The Brits had been there before. This is about uh, March of 1943. Mm -hmm. Now, when you're in Ar Ar Iran, where, where are you staying? And uh, what was it called? What was the location? We built a camp outside of Tehran, mm -hmm. and it's called a it was called Amirabad. Could you spell that for me? Yes, A M I R A B A D. Amirabad. Mm -hmm. And built barracks. Not unlike the ones that you had slept in in Fort Dix. Mm -hmm. And you had a cot, and that's where you, you lived and uh, had your equipment, and you, you stayed there. Mm -hmm. At this point, when you arrive in Tehran, do you know that your responsibility is going to be doing entertaining yes, for the troops? Yes, I, I knew that uh, when I got on the ship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I had, had begun that, and when we got to, to Tehran, that was the headquarters of the Persian Gulf Command. And it wasn't long before we were visited by Soviet troops. I would spell that T-R-O-U-P-E-S, uh -huh. because they were professional entertainers, but they were all in uniform, part of the Soviet Army, and they were wonderful. They had an entire chorus of 30 guys, a whole row of accordions. They had jugglers, uh, dancers, they had a one man uh, simply re recited uh, Pushkin, hmm. the great Russian writer, and uh, we were entertained by them, and they, they sent two or three of these units down to perform for us. One evening we were entertaining them and feeding them. We, by that time we had gotten fresh fresh bread and uh, and butter. We had refrigerated ships, finally, and we had, of course, Spam was uh, available. We were feeding these Soviet performers, and they were gorging themselves, and their commanding officer all of a sudden called them all to attention and marched them out of our mess hall and back to their trucks heading north. Apparently did not want fraternization or Whatever. When yeah. you're when you're in mm -hmm. Camp Amirabad in Tehran, yeah. how long were you there for? As your as your uh, I was there until fourteen months or fifteen. I was there fifteen months, and I 
I had a chance to, uh, I saw a, a notice that they were entertaining applicants for Signal Corps Officer Candidate School, Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. Monmouth is on the list of base closings, by the way. So I went before a board and applied and somehow convinced them oh, I had no uh, experience in communications, telephones, or radio, that with my musical background that my ears were well attuned to to that sensitivity that was uh, required and so they went along with it and I was able to uh, come home. I left Tehran on a troop transport, a, a DC-4, which was a bulbous troop carrier, flew out of Tehran s s south through a dust storm <laughs> We, we went down to, to Khartoum and across to uh, Africa and what was in those years the British Gold Coast. It's now the uh, country of Ghana and its capital is Accra, A-C-C-R-A. Right Landed uh, in Accra and waited for you needed a, a priority to get on an air flight. This was just before D-Day, so that the much shorter northern route was closed off. That's why we had gone south and over to the, the Gold Coast. Encountered a, a terrific dust storm and uh, right out, out out of Tehran and was thrown all around on the airplane. <laughs> it was my very first flight and I said, well, this is what flying must be like. There were bucket seats so that you could carry a great many passengers. So we buckled up in our bucket seats and, uh, and made it through. Take me back for a minute before you, yeah. you, before you got on that, that plane. Yes. You spent 15 months right. in uh, Camp Mirabad. Tell, right. me, tell me a little bit about what you did on those 15 months when you were there. Okay. What, what were your days like? Well, as I said, we had a number of uh, Soviet units who came down to perform for us. And our commanding general, General Connolly, figured that we better put a show together and send it up to perform for the Soviets. And as I mentioned, the, the Army was segregated, and there were a great many African-American GIs, so they were all down at the ports unloading the ships. So a rather naive special services officer, a Captain Etter, I remember, went down and said they would like to put a show together to go up to perform for the Russians. Can anybody here sing? Well, you can imagine in temperatures uh, well over 100 degrees, unloading ships was not a very desirable activity. And a lot of hands went up. And he picked about 40 guys and brought them all up to the headquarters in Tehran, in the mm -hmm. northern part of Iran and turned them over to me. I had just arrived, said, Arbor, we want to put a show together. This is your responsibility. Mm -hmm. And and that's what I did. What's your rank at the time? At that time, I think I was promoted to, we had technical ranks. You had equivalent to a corporal, but it was a T5. You had the two stripes of but there was a small T under them, indicating that you were you were a technical mm -hmm. corporal, a T5, when I was called. That was my first promotion, and later on I got another stripe and 
became a T4, which is equivalent to a sergeant. But at this time, I was only a T5. You're, uh, you're handling some of the African-American uh, troops who yeah. could sing at this point, right. working with About them. About 40 guys that had been brought down. First of all, we didn't have any music. Mm -hmm. And secondly, none of the guys read music anyway. So what I did was I wrote vocal arrangements from memory for this show, which I called Hallelujah, and I included one of each, one or more of each type or style of American music, so that it would be a, a panorama. I did some, some show songs, some folk songs, and some spirituals, of course. Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, Jericho, and they took that. And we did have some good voices among these fellows. But here I was, a white GI with 40 African-American GIs. But they took me as one of their own, and they were some marvelous guys. I got to uh, know them all, spent every day with them. That's what I did for this time. And we, put the show together. I also, they had a band over there, but they didn't have anybody to play piano. So they invited me to, to join them, and I became the piano player for the, for the band. For the, and I was able to, uh, they had an African-American band over there too. And that's the, the band I chose to, to back up the singers for this, uh, for this show. And we performed throughout our command, and we were ready to go up to perform for the Russians. And that's when I saw the notice of applications for signal car OCS at Monmouth. So you're doing these performances in, yes. in Tehran. Right. Well, and throughout the command. Throughout the command. Tell oh. me where that means when you say throughout the command. Where did that take you to? Well, he went. Tehran is, is close, it's in the upper portion of Iran, but there were, there were troops uh, throughout. We had toured Awaz and north to Kazvin and, and various parts of Iran where troops were stationed, again for the purpose of, of running supplies up through the country to the Soviet Union. When you would perform for them, where would you physically perform? Well, in, in, in Tehran, they had built a rec hall, a recreation hall, built out of bricks with uh, just benches, a little bit like a Quaker meeting house, hard wooden benches. And I remember one night, this is where I spoke of the darkness, where our, the generator failed and, w and the the lights went out. So I played in the dark for about 45 minutes, I would guess, until they got the generator up and working again. And the guys just stayed there and, and were uh, very attentive. But that's what, it, they built barracks. The Amirabad, where we left, is now part of the University of Tehran, I've been told.